Age Reversal by Engineered Viruses Written by Robert B. Bryson Narrated by Gary Roloffs Preface, February 15, 2016 Greetings. There are two problems in our species which might be correctable. We were shortchanged on our DNA allotment. There are many animals on our planet that have better DNA processes. We would like to improve your DNA, as described in the following chapters. Here are a few suggestions for solving some problems and moving in the right direction. Your consciousness and intellect are of great value. Another purpose of this paper is to increase awareness of a new direction in the treatment of diseases, damages, and birth defects. A new type of medicine will be described. This medicine, made of viral particles, functions by removing, replacing, or adding DNA to selected tissue. This ability will correct the deficiencies of DNA that were not included during the evolution of the species, as well as cure a large number of diseases, actually over 4,000. In addition to repairing genetic diseases, these medicines can be directed against both viral and bacterial diseases. Also, this type of medicine will be used to eliminate the ultimate killer of all humans, aging. The following chapters will describe cures for a few diseases which do not respond to current chemical medicines in use. A key feature of this process is the method of training viruses to recognize stem cells. Enough that if a very large number of virions are put in the presence of a stem cell, some will be suited to recognize the stem cell. A cell with cancer has recognizable differences from a normal cell, especially its odor and its surface mechanism of shedding the particles which comprise the odor. Dogs have been trained to detect cancer by its smell. The application of mechanical engineering expertise, rather than biological, makes it possible to manipulate viruses well ahead of existing technology. Using viruses as medicines, the control of some diseases, which researchers have been working for years to conquer, is within reach. Corollary problems are the attitudes and reasons for existence of the pharmaceutical industries. Also, there are non-profit organizations which collect funds for purportedly looking for cures. How does this work? Is there a conflict of interest? If actual cures were discovered, it would mean the end of some very lucrative jobs. I have always wondered why I never got a response from Susan G. Komen Foundation when I proposed my breast cancer cure. A conflict of interest? Some diseases don't seem to have any organizations that are really pursuing a cure. Some have goals that don't make much sense. When I proposed my AIDS cure to the Magic Johnson Foundation, Magic Johnson has AIDS, I received a reply that they had no interest in finding a cure, that they were only looking for ways to prevent people from getting the disease. AIDS seems to be a disease that has no organization championing a cure. I started working on it because it was my first effort at designing a virus to attack a disease, and there was a lot of information on it. A Ph.D. molecular biologist friend looked at my work and said she would expect test samples to be produced in about two weeks after turning on the system. I attended a meeting of an organization called CONTACT, which was connected with the University of California. The purpose of CONTACT was to bring together pharmaceutical manufacturers and student entrepreneurs to provide support for the development of drug interventions. When I described how my HIV countervirus would remove HIV provirus from infected cells, there were a few moments of silence. Then somebody shouted out, Hey, that's a cure! Everyone started laughing. I was dumbfounded. The moderator shouted at me, Haven't you heard of Jonas Salk? When's the last time you got a polio shot? The person in the chair next to me explained, when Salk got rid of polio, he got rid of the income from polio vaccines. These people are looking for drugs to sell, like another aspirin. I was laughed out of the meeting. That's how it is. I learned that 260,000 newborn babies test positive for HIV every year. 
That is quite a gold mine for manufacturers of HIV drugs. They would certainly be a group that would not want to see a cure for the disease. I have two strategies designed, both using engineered viruses as medicines. In the first strategy, the virus would recognize a diseased cell, enter it, and disable the disease. The second strategy would be for the virus to recognize a diseased or unwanted cell and kill it. I have designs and flowcharts for making two viruses to demonstrate these uses. The first is a virus which recognizes HIV infection in a cell, enters the cell, then removes the HIV provirus from the human DNA and splices the loose ends back together. A retrovirus unable to integrate a provirus will have its infectivity reduced to a thousandth of normal. I believe that reduction should be enough to eliminate the infection. It is also likely that a retrovirus which has integrated a provirus and had that provirus removed will suffer an even greater reduction in infectivity. I have designed and engineered a second virus to recognize breast cancer stem cells and kill them. This includes any that have metastasized. To stop the development growth of cancer, all you need to do is kill the cancerous stem cells, which make up about 2% of the cancer. The rest of the cancer will die of senescence. If the requirement to have the virus recognize breast tissue were deleted, the only requirement for the virus would be to recognize a cancerous stem cell of any sort of tissue, there would be a much wider application. I had proposed my anti-breast cancer virus to the NIH. Their reply was that there was no proof that a virus could be trained to recognize a breast cancer stem cell. That is true. There is no proof. There is a different kind of logic at work here that does not require proof that an event will happen. If you were in Las Vegas operating a slot machine, how many times would you have to pull the lever to get just one small win? What if you pulled the lever 22 million times? Would you get at least one win? I think you could say with absolute certainty that you would get at least one win and very likely many more. Yet there is no proof or guarantee of that happening. I'm not talking about any big wins or jackpots, just any small win. The same logic prevails in these systems. 22 million tests is a two-week runtime. At any win, the winning viral entity testing starts anew, and it is just a little bit closer to its goal. Step by step, the natural mutations present in the virus that allow a virus to invade new territory are brought into play. The testing system rewards the virions performing correctly and discards those which fail. Eventually, a winner is produced. I believe that the coming medicines will be engineered viruses. They can be made to perform a great variety of tasks and can be made to produce minimal or no side effects. One of the manufacturing steps in making the anti-breast cancer virus is keeping its recognition ability open enough to recognize anyone's breast cancer, not just the person's cancer cells that it was developed from. The specificity could be useful. An associate suggested that support from anti-smoking groups might be had if a feature was added that would cause an anti-cancer virus to deactivate if there was any nicotine present in a person seeking treatment, a way to reduce the number of smokers and the accompanying cigarette smoke. This is certainly possible. In addition, if it were desired to increase specificity, all that is needed is to add the appropriate tests. A virus could be developed to target an individual depending on chemical signals in the body such as some popular deodorant, mouthwash, diet combination, beverages, skin lotion, medicines, or unique combination of recreational drugs. Every time a new test feature is added, it is necessary to redo all of the previous tests to ensure that the new feature does not disturb any previous ability. This makes for a profoundly well-tested end product. A brief look at automation robotics and where the manipulation of viruses fits in. There are two types of automated systems, soft automation and hard automation. Hard automation is used when the design of things being manipulated is fixed.
This is what is used at Budweiser, Schlitz, Mattel, and Charmin. These are heavy steel machines operating with gears, cranks, and levers. There is generally little adjustment capability. Charmin, toilet tissue manufacturer, is certainly a fine example of hard automation, large, non-adjustable machines. Soft automation is where the assembly machines can be adjusted easily by using programmable robots as the product design changes, which is frequently. This is what is used at Apple Computer, where I worked designing assembly systems. The factory was always at a frantic pace, very exhilarating to be there. There was an event that demonstrated just how flexible their robotics were. One afternoon, there was a big hubbub, and the manager appeared at my door. He said, It's Steve Jobs' birthday tomorrow, and he's coming to visit the factory. Get a robot to cut up a birthday cake. I rounded up lots of cake, including test cakes, and got a programmer to write a cake-cutting sequence for one of our big five Axis robots, which had been at work assembling computer keyboards. Late that afternoon, the first test cutting was done. There was a problem with frosting sticking to the knife and making a mess. I had a programmer write a routine that would have the robot stick the knife into a bucket of water after each cut and spin the wrist at 500 RPM to wash the frosting off. That all worked fine. The next day, Steve Jobs arrived and was eventually brought to the cake-cutting area. The tech was given the signal to cut the cake. The robot whipped the knife around and cut the cake into precision rectangular pieces, plunging the knife into the bucket after each cut and spinning the water to a froth, greatly amusing the crowd. It all worked perfectly. The robot finished and stood there with its arms upraised, motors growling to hold position. It was as though the robot was defending the cake. It was intimidating. No one moved. I asked the tech to pull the plug. The robot relaxed. The motors wound down. People relaxed and moved forward, getting their cake. Introduction, January 15, 2016 I am a mechanical engineer specializing in automated manufacture and robotics. I will discuss aging, breast cancer, and AIDS. It has been proven that the cause of aging and the deterioration it produces is the erosion of DNA base pairs, called telomeres, at the ends of our DNA strands in all of our stem cells. The erosion causes the construction of new tissue to be degraded. The erosion occurs when a cell manufactures new tissue to replace worn-out tissue. After a number of these replication cycles have occurred, and increasingly degraded tissue is produced, the tissue will eventually fail to function. The solution to this problem is to replace the missing telomeres. With the full complement of telomeres, new tissue manufactured will be as it was in youth. However, even with replaced telomeres, the aging process will start over again. The replaced telomeres will continue to erode and will have to be replaced from time to time in order to maintain youth. If we select 10 years as the renewal cycle, that would mean that a treated individual would maintain an age between 20 and 30. Eventually, a way will be found to make the rewinds permanent. I have described several engineered viruses in this paper. A benefit of engineered viral medicines is that they are easily adjustable to perform specific tasks, as well as being specific for the tissue targeted, so that there will be no side effects in fact, testing for performance and lack of side effects is part of the manufacturing process, unlike chemical medicines, which are not adjustable and come with a list of side effects which often include death. The delivery and installation of the telomeres would be done using engineered retroviruses designed to minimize detection and attack by the body's immune system. Concurrent with the rewind virus, and in order to optimize its use and maximize the lifespan, as many fatal diseases as possible should be eliminated. Here is a start of that effort. 
I have two strategies, both using engineered viruses as medicines. In the first strategy, the virus would recognize a diseased cell, enter it, and disable the disease. The second strategy would be for the virus to recognize a diseased or unwanted cell and kill it. I have designs and manufacturing flowcharts for making two viruses to demonstrate these uses. The first is a virus which recognizes HIV infection in a cell, enters the cell, and then removes the HIV provirus from the human DNA and splices the loose ends together. Without an integrated provirus, a retrovirus will have its infectivity reduced to one one-thousandth of normal. I believe that reduction should be enough to eliminate the infection. The second virus is engineered to recognize breast cancer stem cells and kill them. This includes many that have metastasized. To kill breast cancer, all you need to do is kill the cancerous stem cells, which make up only about 2% of the cancer. The rest of the breast cancer will die of senescence. If the requirement to have the virus recognized breast tissue were deleted, the only requirement for the virus would be to recognize a cancerous stem cell of any sort of tissue that might be a cure for any cancer. The key ingredient here is the invention of a process to engineer a virus which recognizes stem cells. At this time, the bioresearch community has no way to recognize a stem cell in situ. The suspect cell must be removed and tested. This does not allow for any treatment of stem cells while they are part of a person's body. Having a stem cell recognizing virus makes possible treatments previously thought impossible. Chapter 1. Breast Cancer. February 13, 2016. Consider the biochemical environment in and surrounding breast cancer. It is known that breast cancer is always breast cancer. Although it may metastasize and migrate to various places in the body, it is still breast cancer and has features which identify it as breast cancer. There are numerous chemical differences between breast cancer and normal breast tissue which will be used to support an environment suitable for adapting a virus to adjust to. That is, a virus is adjusted and selected to grow, replicate in the breast cancer stem cell environment and no other. Why breast cancer stem cells? The breast cancer stem cells, consisting of a very small percentage of the cancer, are the only part of the cancer that is reproducing and growing. Kill them and you stop the progression of the cancer. The other cancer cells will eventually die of senescence. The problem we have today with breast cancer treatments is that they are not specific enough. Tissue other than breast cancer is affected and if enough of such nonspecific medicine is used to kill the cancer, you might kill the patient. As it has been in my personal experience, sufficient medicine was given to make a close friend of mine very sick, but still it was not enough to kill her cancer. If the environment of a replicating virion is adjusted, a virion is an individual viral entity, a collection of these is called a virus, a change of nutrients, a change of temperature, and then the individual virions best suited to the new environment will prosper, and the virions not suited to the new environment will cease to exist. The environment which would be created by my equipment functions the same way. Virions selected for survival are the ones which recognize the biochemical environment of cancer. A virus will be selected which is able to perform required tasks. Given the system I have designed, many viruses would do the job. The first required viral feature is that the virus needs to gain access to the particular tissue containing the cancer cells and the cancer cells' DNA. It is known that within every cell that has a nucleus and DNA within that nucleus, that there are a number of nuclear sequences of ancient viruses. Surprisingly, in human DNA, the viral content is about 10%, and the human content is only 3.5%. Every time the cell replicates, the viral particles are replicated also. 
Since these viral sequences may have parts of viruses that recognize and infect a tissue type and enter the nucleus, there will be a benefit to using these particles as a starting point. In the development of a virus specific for breast cancer, the automated manufacturing process is differentiated to recognize and use the biochemical differences between cancer and non-cancer. This is done by testing the prospective virus against samples of cancerous and normal cells. To ensure that the virus being produced does not attack or replicate in normal breast tissue, a cell line of normal breast tissue will be present in the system as well as samples of other normal tissues to be tested to the extent needed where we can be confident that a virus produced would not replicate or recognize and infect normal tissue. Once the equipment is charged with the above cell lines and nutrient for maintenance, the operation is as follows. A sample test virus is amplified, that is, it is replicated in quantity. It is necessary to do this because although there might be present a single copy of exactly what we want, a single copy would not be sufficient for making tests and observing results. The test sample is easily produced using PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Since the test sample we start with will likely contain an assortment of virions with varying DNA-RNA sequences, we would like to develop a sample of virions more closely related. We sort the sample into sequences of closely similar lengths using agarose gel electrophoresis, age. After we select our sample from the age, we do a second PCR amplification. The amplified virions are separated into two portions. The first is saved in a temporary receiver so that when the other portion is tested, and if it proves to be moving in the direction we are seeking, we will have a sample to use further. In the testing, we are first looking for whether there is any detectable integration of the virus with the cancer cell line. This is determined by radio labeling the candidate viral DNA and appropriately checking for radiation from the nuclei of the cancer cells it is reacted with. A feature of our system is that it doesn't have to do a perfect job. It doesn't have to even come close. All we need to do is detect any slight propensity to perform for a candidate virus to get caught in the loop and have its desirable features strengthened and its quantity multiplied. All that is needed for the system is simple, basic equipment. However, to produce results in a meaningful time frame, the system will cycle at 20,000 tests per hour. A single electrophoresis separation might take four hours, with the result of 80,000 tests being performed at a single time. The quantities of viral product are kept reasonable by using high throughput equipment working with micromillimeter portions. Associates have said that they would expect to see a correct virus begin to appear after as few as 100,000 tests. The high throughput of the manufacturing system would allow product to be made quickly or the time could be used to make a therapeutic virus so specific that it would be effective only on the individual whose cell lines were used in the development. The cloning and multiplication at this time is to ensure sufficient copies of mutants to allow further processing. The appearance upstream at this step of a single mutant of desirable characteristics might otherwise go undetected. The end product by this system will be a non-replicating virus engineered to kill all actively reproducing breast cancer cells, including those which have metastasized. The virus will have been in vitro tested and ready for use. Prostate cancer. The mechanism of prostate cancer is the same as the mechanism of breast cancer, errant stem cells. To develop an antiprostate cancer virus, I would start with anti-breast cancer virus and delete the requirement that the tissue attacked needs to be breast tissue. This will further produce a virus that will attack any and all cancerous stem cells. As in breast cancer, this anti-cancer virus will be effective even in advanced cases since it will recognize metastasized cancerous cells wherever they are. Chapter 2 
HIV AIDS, February 13, 2016. In an HIV infection, the HIV integrates provirus, genetic instructions for making the infected cell manufacture HIV copies, into the human DNA. This kind of insertion is the opposite of the process which occurs as insulin is manufactured in the body. The precursor to insulin has a lot of segments of useless material, introns, which may have to be spliced out before the insulin can function. The introns are removed in a way that brings the two ends of the molecule together so that the strand is never separated when the intron is removed. The reverse of this process is thought to be the mechanism the HIV uses to splice its provirus into the human DNA. The actual loosening of the DNA connections is done by an enzyme carried with the HIV. Part of the process of attacking the HIV infection would be the use of such an enzyme to remove the provirus, be there one copy or many. Another feature we will use in the manufacture of what we call a countervirus is that when the HIV first recognizes surface features on a target cell it is going to infect, it makes some modification to that surface feature. This modification prevents additional HIV from infecting the cell. The first HIV to infect reserves the target cell for itself. What we will require of our countervirus is that it will recognize the modification. We want the countervirus to infect only HIV-infected cells. If reinfection of a cell were done by another HIV, superinfection, that is not in the best interest of the HIV and is probably only rarely done, if at all. In the environment of our system, however, superinfection is necessary and is a requirement for survival of the countervirus. It is known that if a virus which ordinarily inserts a provirus into host DNA is unable to do so, the replication rate of that virus is reduced to one thousandth of its normal rate. This is the strategy we have chosen to remove provirus from infected cells. How do we do this? The process is as follows. The equipment is charged with live HIV, HIV-infected T cells, and a selection of normal cell types. The first requirement of our countervirus is that it infect previously HIV-infected cells. There are likely the desired mutants in any HIV population. Individuals' virions possessing the desired characteristics will always be present, but because they are not present in significant numbers, they are no threat to the general HIV population. We then copy individual virions, expand them into a measurable quantity using PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Any desired mutants will now be present in workable quantities. We separate the expanded quantity into test and reserve portions. The test quantity is brought to react with the infected T-cell sample. Again, as in a breast cancer test, radio labeling is used. The viral particles are separated from the T-cells. Is radiation present in the remaining T-cells? If not, the separated virus is returned to the common HIV pool, as are the T-cells. If radiation is measured, the system works with the reserve portion of the HIV. This portion is then expanded using PCR and tested against the cell line. Subsequent tests are repeated, seeking radiation levels which would indicate that a significant portion of the test batch is superinfecting. This superinfecting HIV is then tested against a sample of normal T cells uninfected. In a similar manner of PCR and electrophoresis process continues until we have superinfecting HIV which does not infect healthy T cells. The same test is then run on cell line samples of other normal tissue types to ensure that the virus we have selected does not infect them. This interim product could possibly be used to destroy all infected T cells. However, our goal is to disinfect all infected cells without damaging them so as to restore their function. 
For the next step, the system works with HIV-infected T-cells whose proviral components are radio-labeled. The interim product is presented to the T-cell line sample. The HIV and the T-cells are separated, and the T-cells are checked to see if there is a reduction in radiation. When a reduction is observed, the HIV secondary product is isolated as before and tested against normal T-cells and normal tissue to see that there is no infection. All of the above is designed to happen at a rate of 20,000 samples per hour. That a mutated HIV is capable of extracting provirus is not hard to imagine. It is as easy as a virion having its enzymes positioned wrongly. In the real world, such a virion would not survive. Certainly, it would not be capable of any significant replication. It is the artificial environment of our system which not only favors this aberrant behavior, but requires it. All virions not following these rules are recycled, retrained, or dismantled. From the mutant mess, only the correct are rewarded with survival. How is the HIV countervirus used? If you insert a small quantity of any virus into host mammals, two events occur. First, the defensive system attacks the virus. The part of the defense system not attacking creates an immune reaction to combat further infections. If a sufficiently large quantity of virus is inserted into the host, all of the defenses will go to killing off the invasion, and none of the defenses go to making an immunity. In treating HIV infection, we would introduce a large enough quantity of countervirus so that no immunity would develop. This would allow for future treatment should another HIV infection occur. The product described D1 was the first therapeutic viral treatment designed. The use administration would be via a syringe into the bloodstream. One dose should suffice. At this time, there are no plans to design an extended virus with the capability of replication within the individual. The use of such a virus would be to allow the therapeutic use to be transmitted from individual to individual. Synopsis we have an assembly of automatically controlled machines which maintain an artificial environment. HIV is contained in these environments as well as several cell lines and DNA particles. The HIV is modified so as to produce a mutant version which will perform the following steps. The mutated HIV is referred to as D1 countervirus. The changes to the HIV to convert it to D1 countervirus are 1. It is required to super-infect. 2. It is not able to infect non-HIV infected cells. 3. It expresses enzymes out of order so as to cause the removal of provirus rather than integration into the host DNA. 4. It does not integrate a provirus into the host DNA. 5. It is not self-replicating. Production of D1 is done by transfection. The mutations necessary to cause these actions have been observed in other viruses. It is expected that these changes to the viral DNA are not elaborate or difficult to produce and can be achieved using suitable equipment to detect and enhance the changes sought. The actual process is a simple one, but would be tedious and repetitious using existing equipment. The equipment I propose is automatic and processes in parallel large numbers of virions, performing 20,000 tests per hour. This is necessary to sort, detect, and amplify the very few virions with the desirable characteristics sought. Note that because the D1 vector is unable to insert a provirus into the host DNA, it is not a retrovirus. D1 will begin to be destroyed by the body as soon as it is placed there. The trick to using it is to make the dose sufficient before it is all killed off. The dose can be great enough to prevent any immune response should an individual again become infected with HIV. Chapter 3 Aging, February 13, 2016.
Aging is not a curable disease. It is, however, reversible. Every so often, nearly all of our cells are replaced. We essentially get a brand new body as our worn-out cells replace themselves. The problem of aging, which accumulates, is that errors are made in the process of manufacturing new cells. Also, chemical and radiation damage is accumulated and is incorporated into new replications. There are about 800 cell types subject to this disease. An easily observable effect of this disease is its effect on the skin. As the skin cells replace themselves over time, things go wrong in the process. There is missing DNA. The ends of the DNA become shortened with each replication. Without a full complement of DNA, the skin produced is a degraded version. Missing DNA can be caused by kinks dimers in the DNA caused by the skin being exposed to ultraviolet light. Our bodies have repair mechanisms for removing the kinks, otherwise the skin could not be replaced at all. The repair mechanism splices the kinks out of the DNA. Unfortunately, removing a small portion of DNA every time this happens. Other degradation occurs as the replication process uses up and shortens the telomeres on the ends of the DNA. There are other biochemical activities which may disable needed sequences of DNA. As the years go by, the skin assumes the characteristic degradation we observe in aged individuals. A repair can be achieved by replacing missing DNA and removing and replacing any damaged DNA. This would have to be done repeatedly every few years to maintain whatever degree of youth is desired. Experiments demonstrating the reversal of aging in mice done by Dr. Ronaldo de Pinho have been described in an article in the Los Angeles Times dated December 4, 2010. The reversal of aging in the mice was accomplished by using a telomerase enzyme. This is risky business, as improper use of telomerase can cause cancer. In the mouse, aging reversal using telomerase, the point was to show the cause of aging and that it is possible to reverse it. It was well worth risking the health of a few mice. No one would think of using telomerase on humans at this time. For aging reversal, there is a safe, controllable method of telomere repair. The telomeres needed will be assembled in equipment commercially available. Transporting the telomeres to sites in the tissues where they are to be installed will be done by a virus specific for that tissue and an enzyme to attach the new telomeric sequences to the ends of the DNA strands. A question to be answered is whether the job can be done by just a few different viruses or whether viruses will be needed adjusted to work with each of the 800 cell types. It may be that the aging damage is the same in nearly all cell types. If that is the case, repairs might be made using only a few viruses. When your telomeres are restored, the age reversal will not be noticed immediately. The cells have to live out their normal lifespans and be replaced by the youthful version. Cell life varies from a few weeks in your innards, longer for skin and muscle, and about a year for your bone to be replaced. The rewind only reverses aging to the extent that your body will have healthy, mature cells. Your age cannot be rewound further, say, turning you into a 10-year-old child. Consider supporting this project. You will not only be repairing yourself and your family, but others who will want to use this repair, such as your favorite entertainers, actors, and athletes. Your support could make it possible for these people to be around a long time. It may be possible to have a pet accompany you on your extended life journey. After all, aging reversal was first done using small animals. Chapter 4. Cosmetics in the near future. February 13, 2016. The genes expressing skin color and other features are in the process of being identified. Retroviral transport and exchange to swap or exchange DNA and stem cells would affect just about everything describing a person. 
knowing what sequences of DNA does what would result in the ability to sit down at a computer and adjust your features as shown on a display by turning dials on the controls. Body shape, height, muscularity, eye, hair, and skin color would all be adjusted by rotating dials or pushing buttons. For the ladies, it is certainly well known that few, if any, women exist such as the bathing suit models appearing in various magazines. What is presented are photoshopped composites made up of the most applicable features of numerous women. Soon, too, will be your ability to select features you desire from a library of DNA collected from women who have donated DNA samples. We won't have to actually use those samples, just be able to read them and synthesize the DNA. There will be no reason to be overweight, too thin, too short, too tall. You will have the opportunity to adjust yourself sitting in front of a computer screen to be whatever you want to be. For the men, similar to the ladies, you could make a composite from a collection of DNA assembled from male athletes, muscle builders, rodeo stars, and circus acrobats. You could start your reconstruction using a DNA source from any of the above and add more muscle and height. Some creatures have the ability to replace lost limbs, crabs, and lobsters. There is one animal which outdoes all the rest. The axolotl salamander can regrow missing limbs and more. If you remove half of its brain, it will regrow the missing half. In replacing missing limbs, consider that the bones and joints are crushed and splintered, yet all gets sorted out and properly repaired, as well as damaged organs. The DNA of the axolotl salamander contains a number of simple repeated sequences. Somehow, these sequences allow the animal to do these repairs or replacements. If copies of these repeat sequences were incorporated into human DNA, what would be the extent of the repair's replacement we could expect? I can understand replacing a missing limb, but what about repairing some deformity or diseased organ? We would get a better idea of what is possible with more experiments on axolotl salamanders. At least the repeat sequences do not code for parts of the animal, so we can be certain a person with the sequences would not be sprouting gills, growing webbed fingers, or a forked tongue. It will eventually be possible to add to the human DNA so that humans will have the ability to grow replacement limbs. We are aware of a few humans who, in their 80s, are cutting their third set of teeth. It would be a matter of comparing the DNA of these individuals with the DNA of a normal individual to discover the DNA sequences responsible. The process could then be applied to those desiring the ability to grow new teeth by using a retrovirus to insert the DNA sequences responsible at the correct site in the correct tissue. Our efforts at developing a tissue-specific virus in our breast cancer therapy takes the first steps needed to develop such a system. More investigation will provide the means to turn the system on in a selective manner. No need to grow a whole set of teeth if you only need to replace one or two. And perhaps the regular replacement of teeth is not necessary, perhaps only once. Bacterial Diseases The Treatment of Disease Caused by Bacteria a virus could be trained to replicate in any particular bacteria and destroy it. Chapter 5, DNA Repair Systems, February 13, 2016 The present scientific community has no way to recognize a stem cell in situ. What is done now is to remove a suspected stem cell and transplant it into a lab animal where it is observed for signs of stem cell behavior. This is a far cry from recognizing a stem cell in an individual and performing treatment or gene therapy. What D Foundation is proposing is to use a virus trained to recognize stem cells. 
any therapy DNA would be integrated into the virus and installed in the stem cells using the existing mechanisms of the virus. So you have the whole package, stem cell recognition and therapy mechanics, all in one. Our viral training is a mechanical system which makes use of the natural functions of the virus. A virus, when it reproduces, creates a number of mutant versions. This results in the virus expanding its range of targets to infect. In our system, the mutant virions, the individuals which compose a virus, are tested for their ability to recognize stem cells. We propose to do the testing at the rate of 20,000 tests per hour using high-throughput robotics. Once we have the stem cell recognizing virus, we will install the DNA sequences copied from a salamander which give it the ability to regrow limbs. Although there are a number of creatures able to regrow limbs, the axiotal salamander is the best choice because it has four limbs with five digits on the end of each. We will then be ready to test this on lab animals. It will eventually be possible to add to the human DNA so that humans will have the ability to grow replacement limbs. If we install into a human stroke victim the salamander DNA sequences which code for major repairs, the human brain might repair itself. The same applies to paralysis caused by spinal injury. The salamander doesn't have just a few tricky sequences to be able to make major repairs, its DNA is just more extensive than ours. The salamander has 10 billion more base pairs than ours, that's a third larger, and seems to consist of a lot of repetitious sequences. 85% of our DNA looks just like that, repetitious sequences, and is often referred to as junk DNA, serving no purpose. Perhaps it is just that we don't understand the purpose. Other DNA enhancements, by copying certain DNA sequences from animals, it will be possible to have the scent-detecting ability of a drug-sniffing dog. You could walk around the neighborhood and tell what everyone had for dinner. Try your nose at prospecting. Most metals, when corroding or combining with other elements, cause the production of organic compounds that have odors. You might be able to sniff out a new mine. If you had the hearing ability of a cat, you could hear the exact location of termites in your house. Another interesting upgrade possibility. There is a tough little creature existing called a water bear, tardigrade. The water bear lives in shallow puddles of water and eats algae. If the puddle dries up, the water bear can go more than 20 years without eating, drinking, or breathing. It can also repair its own DNA. When the puddle again has water, the animal revives and continues on. There may be some application of these abilities to humans for long-distance space travel. Chapter 6. Resurrection. February 13, 2016. There are several organizations which are in the process of reviving extinct animals. The organizations are confident they will be successful. Some parts of their methods are applicable to humans. There are two processes for resurrecting a person. The first is to grow a new replica body from DNA. This will produce a full-grown human appearing to be about 20 years of age. The reason that a full-grown person is produced instead of a baby is that the DNA being used is from a fully-grown person. In the order of increasing difficulty of attaining a DNA sample, 1. DNA from a live person, 2. A recently dead person, 3. A long dead person, such as Sir Isaac Newton, currently located in Westminster Abbey, 4. A person no longer existing, cremated or lost at sea. In case 4, the process would include passing a vacuum cleaner over a person's former living area, vacuuming the insides of the clothing worn by the restoree, and then doing a DNA sort to separate debris from human DNA. A final confirming step would be to read the DNA and use a computer to print a photographic likeness of the individual. Efforts are underway to be able to do this. 
In case one, if a new body is assembled before the revivee has died, he will have the sensation of being in two places at the same time. This situation would only happen if an individual was in really bad shape, incurable disease or severe damage, and has decided to go ahead and replace his entire body. The full-grown new body, appearing to be about 20 years of age, could be grown in a nutrient bath in about eight weeks. This body would be devoid of knowledge, skills, or memories. All that will have to be downloaded to the new brain. In case one, the downloading could be done by the revivee himself. Otherwise, the information will come from family members, friends, and acquaintances who have memories of interactions with the revivee. This will include speech, recognition of individuals, muscle memory for walking, using arms and legs and hands. This information will take the new body from the mental status of a newborn to that of a 20-year-old with self-awareness. That these brain transmissions exist, there is proof. A paralyzed astrophysicist, Stephen Hawking, wears a receiver transmitter on his eyeglasses, which picks up signals from his brain, allowing him to operate a computer that translates his thoughts into words. The system. I will describe some details about some of the equipment which will have to be fabricated, as there are no such devices on the market. The Virion Pickup very tiny quantities of virions in nutrient solutions will have to be manipulated. I am borrowing a mechanical device from textile manufacturing. In the printing of designs on cloth, the design features are etched into the surface of a copper roller. The roller is submerged in dye to a slight amount. A six-inch diameter roller, 30 inches long, is dipped into dye about a quarter of an inch. As the roller rotates and brings up the dye, the surface of the roller is contacted by a blade which wipes off the excess dye, leaving dye only in the etched depressions making up the design. In the viral manipulating system, there will be a rotating wheel, one inch in diameter and a quarter inch wide, rotating in the viral mixture. There will be a blade set within point zero 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 one of the rotating surface. This will leave a thin film on the drum. The material pickup will occur when a robot arm moves a sharp needle to within .00005 inches of the drum. This will be enough to wet the tip of the needle. Compare this to actually dipping a needle into a liquid surface. The surface tension would draw up and load an entire drop of liquid onto the needle. This is far more than is needed or desired. Once the sample is on the needle tip, the robot arm will transfer it to an agarose gel electrophoresis separator, which is as follows. The agarose gel will be on a moving belt. The belt will move the sample from the site of insertion to make room for the next sample. There will be sliding electrical contacts riding on the surface of the gel to perform the electrolytic migration, which will sort the samples by size. The electrolytic separation could take several hours. With the samples being loaded on at 20,000 per hour and a four-hour runtime, the belt will contain 80,000 samples at any one time. The belt length and the sample spacing will be adjusted to accommodate the quantity. On the belt, the needle will insert 50 samples in a row. The belt will then index to the next position an eighth of an inch farther and pause for the next row to be filled. A second method, that of using radio telescopes placed at far intervals from Earth to intercept brain waves and reverse engineer them to manufacture the DNA to grow a body and a brain containing all of the thoughts and memories of the revivee, is a technology we do not have at this time. We expect eventually it will come from some advanced alien civilization, or it may be here now. Chapter 7 Future Upgrades, February 15, 2016 Eventually, after more information is collected on how DNA expresses features in humans, we will be able to adjust those features. I thought that a great step forward was accomplished with the discovery of the actual content of human DNA, 85% junk, 
10% virus, 3.5% human. Instead of looking through 2 billion base pairs, we only have to concern ourselves with 70 million base pairs. It will come to sitting in front of a computer screen, adjusting facial arrangement, eye color, skin color, height, weight, etc., where the output of the system is a single dose of liquid capable of making many of the inputted changes. Adjusting bone structure will take longer. The repair of aging and the elimination of fatal diseases will extend your lifespan to 1,720 years. The 1,720 is the result of a rough calculation comparing the entire human population with the number of accidental deaths per year, such as lightning strikes, drownings, shootings, etc. If you live carefully and avoid accidents, the 1,720 does not apply. A few thoughts on what to do with all this spare time. All of us can recall events in the past where we did something that was not the best solution, and that as time passes and we become more experienced and knowledgeable, the better solutions for those past errors becomes obvious. Well, in many cases, here is your chance to do it right this time, 1,720 years, time enough to achieve greatness. Music? Any and all instruments. You have time to become musician, surgeon, scientist, financier, or whatever. 1,720 years. Time enough to adjust the body to accommodate. Possibly a body that does not need to breathe air or eat food. Maybe plug in education. No need to take the time to attend a university for 10 years and then put in years of residency to get your doctorate. You would merely pay twenty nine ninety five for a flash drive app the size of a poppy seed, which for amusement would include surprise package consisting of knowledge of hands-on experience of operating a steam locomotive or playing a concert grand piano. Starting out as an old-timer, not only with the knowledge, but with muscle memory as though you had 30 years of hands-on experience, you could easily and confidently cross the Grand Canyon on a wire, do a professional job of tungsten inert gas welding, and be a highly proficient paraglider pilot. The reason for having ability to be a design engineer, both mechanical and electrical, proficiency in all types of surgery and medicine, and a host of other trades, is to enable self-sufficiency and enhance your desirability to alien civilizations to restore you. You are not going to be doing eye surgery or root canals on yourself, but if there is one other person available, they can put on a wrist university and you can trade root canals with your partner on long space flights. Chapter 8. Origin of D Foundation. February 13, 2016. I was given a contract to do some design improvements for a wheelchair company. After a few contacts with people who rented out wheelchairs as to what their ideas for improvements might be, I watched a few people who used wheelchairs. I thought I might apply my skills at automation, design of automatic manufacturing equipment, and automatic sewing machines to somehow repair the damage which caused paralysis. I contacted the American Paralysis Association and attended a seminar which demonstrated the results of their embryonic tissue transplant project. Their thought was that you could transplant embryonic spinal tissue in the area of spinal damage and that when the embryonic tissue became mature, it would take on the transport of information and signals across the damaged area. The seminar showed transplants in rats, very nicely done and well healed. There was, unfortunately, no cure of paralysis in rats with these transplants. There was another researcher, Gopal Das, working on spinal transplants of this sort, who performed some experiments which led me to develop a concept which I believe would repair the paralysis caused by spinal injury. 
Gopal Das in Neural Transplantation and Regeneration described the process to prepare rats for paralysis experiments. In some of these experiments, 90% of a rat's spinal cord was severed. This immediately produced paralysis, but eventually the rat would recover from the paralysis. The 90% severing could be from either lateral direction, and the results were the same. My thought of this paralysis, then eventual recovery, is that this is powerful proof of how signals, nerves, structure, or whatever does not regenerate axially from a severed nerve, but does regenerate laterally. Many things in nature follow the rule of lateral regeneration. Chop the top off a pine tree, and the new growth comes out laterally. It would explain how, in a rat with 90% of its spine severed, that the control signals got from one side of the spine to the other. Looking at a damaged tree from a cliff in the Big Sur, California, was when I figured this out, observing that new growth is not axial but lateral. My strategy to make use of this lateral regeneration in repairing spinal paralysis is to stretch some undamaged spinal material from the undamaged tissue upstream or downstream of the damage through the damaged region into undamaged tissue on the other side of the damage. The repair experiment would consist of stretching a tube of spinal tissue from below the damage to a position above the damage. This would be done with a tube with a cutting edge. Brain tissue survives only a short time without oxygen. I expect spinal tissue to be the same. To prevent oxygen starvation of the stretched material, I would perform the process of insertion, stretch, and removal of the tube within three or four seconds. There is a design for a steerable tube. I am willing to donate my services and machine shop to build equipment for anyone interested in experimenting with this process. Repair of Spinal Injury Causing Paralysis The following process does not use viruses. It is a mechanical process based on experiments done by Dr. Gopal Das on rats. It is included here for historical interest because it was the project that got D Foundation started. A surgical repair process is presented which makes use of and expands on the Gopal Das test results. There are two which I have combined in a surgical combination best called an autologous spine transplant. We know from neural transplantation and regeneration that a rat's spine, if severed 90%, will paralyze the rat, but in time the rat will recover motor function. Consider what has to have happened to restore the motor function. First, signals from the severed material have to migrate to an undamaged parallel structure. Second, the signal must travel downstream in the parallel structure to some place past the damaged area. Third, the signals migrate to the undamaged portions of their original signal paths. And finally, fourth, the new signal route is made permanent. It is certainly incredible that this is all able to happen. I proposed a mechanical repair mechanism that utilizes this repair mechanism. More recent experiments show that the damage can be increased to 95% and the rat will still recover. We observe that neurological structures occurring elsewhere in the plant and animal kingdoms will sometimes make repairs and regrow, but not in an axial direction. Repair growth is always at a right angle to the axis. The few creatures possessing axial regrowth capability and the ability to regrow severed limbs, such as the axiotal salamander, have more DNA than humans and have more elaborate repair mechanisms encoded. One day it may be possible to have these extra instructions added to our DNA. For now, we have to make do with a mechanical repair process which makes use of the above information. 5 to 10 percent of the spinal material has to be restored and neural repair growth occurs at about 90 degrees to the axis of the neuron. I propose an experiment.
to test the efficacy of a mechanical displacement to restore motor function. A segment of spinal material is made to bridge across the area of damage, thus representing an opportunity for control signals to migrate at 90 degrees from the axis of functioning neurons, connect with the undamaged spinal tissue, proceeding along the transplanted segment, and ultimately migrating at 90 degrees to the correct neuron and thence to and from their final destination. I incorporated D Foundation Limited, a 501c3 nonprofit, to pursue experimentation and possibly to get some financial assistance. Chapter 9 The MHC Major Histocompatibility Complex September 19, 2015 This feature on all cells in the body allows the immune system and other defensive works to distinguish between foreign cells and those which are part of the individual. The MHC is the reason immunosuppressive drugs are needed in most organ transplants. A retrovirus could be used to swap the MHC of the donor parts to match that of the recipient. Not only organs, but limbs could be transplanted. War damage could be lessened if the combatants, when they get their vaccinations, etc., also would get a shot of virus that would make all recipients as though they were identical twins. All parts would be interchangeable. A damaged service person missing an arm or a leg might be in a field hospital for a few hours, waiting for replacement parts to show up, but the repairs would be simple and quick. Bone connectors could be installed to provide a strong enough repair so that the individual could be sent back to fight in a few days. Chapter 10. The Way Forward. February 13, 2016. Every thought you have ever had, even when you were in your mother's womb, and every word you have ever spoken, produces electromagnetic brain waves which travel outward at the speed of light. These are joined by the brain waves of all other living humans, as well as the thoughts of all thinking creatures, right down to the thoughts of the smallest insects. Even a gnat has plans of how to get through the day. If this radiation were to be intercepted, a complete representation of all sentient beings on this planet would be available for review or other purposes. An advanced alien civilization could select individuals to be restored, animated, or reconstruct and restore the entire population of planet Earth for the purpose of creating a world-sized zoo for their amusement. All of this information is readily available to advanced alien civilizations. Easy and rapid surveys can be made using the instantaneous effects of gravity. Multiple sampling stations can be assembled out of cosmic dust so that it does not take 50 years to read the thoughts of a 50-year-old person. An entire 50-light-year display could be read in seconds. This is possible now or long after the sun has expanded, burnt out, and left the earth as a molten ball of rock. Your thoughts will continue on, though you will not be aware of the passage of time. You will experience some sort of consciousness from time to time, as atoms and molecules, through chance, become assembled to duplicate your brain process. This could happen naturally as evolution proceeds in suitable environments or an alien civilization on surveying your thoughts could develop enough interest in you to construct a working model. How great is the need for alien civilizations, ACs, to collect human specimens? It could just be an effort to repopulate a decimated civilization or to refresh a jaded one. Is the AC composed of humans? Or is it robots working a plan devised by a long-gone humanoid population? The more outstanding of our population have likely been identified and revived. Consider Albert Einstein, 
What a benefit to have him revived, have a great many questions answered by the A.C., and for him to use this new knowledge to project onward. You may not be another Einstein or Steve Jobs or Nikolai Tesla, but you can become a highly desirable specimen of interest to be revived if you partake in D Foundation's 251720 programs. Live at age 25 for 1,720 years. This will provide you with enough time to greatly expand your skills. Become a brain surgeon, rocket scientist, astronomer, musician, proficient in many different instruments, steam locomotive engineer, physicist, or whatever else you want to learn in the 1,720 years allotted to you. Not to worry about using up all the space in your brain. Humans are designed to last far longer than 1,720 years. It is a disease that kills us in less than 100 years when we have used up only a fraction of the space of our brains. There is no cure for the disease, but it can be reversed as many times as desired. See Chapter 3. Travel through space, trillions of light-years in distance, will easily be accomplished by the aliens using the instantaneous effect of gravity and by assembling a new body at whatever location they wish to be. It may be easier to grasp the concept by considering that the bodies we currently possess are not the ones we started out with. Cells have been replaced as they wear out, so that after a number of years you have a completely different body. In traveling across light-year distances, you would have a new body constructed at every site you wished to visit. How might consciousness be experienced with multiple bodies? Does it move to the newest creation, or is it spread out among all of the created bodies? Can it be redirected at will? I can't imagine... Is it possible for us to communicate with aliens? Yes, of course. You are communicating with them now via your brain waves. It is up to you to get them interested enough in you to reply to you. Chapter 11. Prevention of Violent Crime February 15, 2016 Here is an example of what could be done now with existing equipment. It is unlikely that the general public would choose this. However, it might have an application in reducing the prison population. Someone serving a lengthy sentence might opt to have their brain monitored and reset to normalcy if it meant their freedom. A brain reset to normal would result in behavior no more troublesome than the general population. The prisoner could be released into society without being a threat. If the prisoner misbehaved or tried to tamper with the implant, he would be frozen in place until the police arrived. Violent Crime. There may be a way to prevent it. Consider a tiny implant in humans, small enough to be almost invisible. This implant would receive input from multiple transmission sources and compare the individual's behavior with a database of criminality information from the individual's brain and visual from the individual's own eyes transmitted to a central system. If an impending crime is detected, a signal would be sent which would cause the individual to freeze in position as well as all persons within a 20-foot radius. The frozen individuals would be unaware of the passage of time. The freeze signal will also send an alert to the local police describing the situation and providing GPS coordinates. Once the police arrive and size up the situation, criminal suspect standing in front of a bank teller with a gun in his hand, for instance, the awareness would be turned back on, but not the motion. To the bank robber, it would seem that the police appeared instantly out of nowhere. There he is, gun in hand, unable to pull the trigger. The police would disarm him. No need to take him to the police station. A computer magistrate would already have studied all of the video evidence, including that of any witnesses, as well as the background of the attempted criminal's behavior, 
and draw on a jury from everyone within a hundred-mile radius. The jurors are polled anonymously so as not to disturb them. There could be several hundred cases a day, and that would be like a full-time job. The bank robber's brain would be downgraded via a signal from the computer magistrate to where he would no longer comprehend his attempted criminal behavior, nor would he have the intellect to repeat the attempt. He would then be released. In his thoughts would be an insatiable desire to have a job pushing a broom, cleaning up the streets. In other attempted crimes, the process would be similar, except that the police would only be involved if a weapon needed to be confiscated. Consider a lone woman walking down a dark street. A mugger appears and moves threateningly towards the woman, blocking her path. He has evil thoughts. Her implant sends an urgent signal. The mugger is instantly immobilized. In microseconds, his brain is evaluated, again the hundred-mile radius of jurors, and adjusted toward some useful employment if needed, and altered to be fearful of the woman he has accosted. He is then released to run in panic down the street. A person refusing to have an implant would not be exempt from control. Quite the opposite. A person lacking an implant would be under a heightened alert scrutiny. Might as well walk around waving a red flag, always the first to be studied in a situation surrounding spurious activity. This has been Age Reversal by Engineered Viruses, written by Robert P. Bryson, narrated by Gary Roloff. Copyright 2017 by Robert P. Bryson. Production Copyright 2017 by Worldwide Publishing Group.